Welcome to Utah State University's Vertebrate Paleontology course. My name is Benjamin Berger, and in this video, I will teach you how to distinguish the astragalus bone of parasodactyls and artiodactyls. Trust me, this will be exciting and a useful skill to have. With the extinction of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago, mammals were able to grow to larger sizes, and there was a significant advantage of having larger body sizes. First, you could cover more ground when, you, when running. You could beat up any smaller predators that might be trying to eat you. And third, you could hold a larger digestive tract to digest more difficult vegetation and have a bigger, bigger belly. In the 10 million years after the extinction of the dinosaurs, many mammals would opt for a larger body size. And the average body size of mammals increased during this time, with the largest Paleocene mammals, a group called the Panodonts, getting to be about the size of a cow. Predators as well got bigger, and these larger mammals had to worry about outrunning these now larger predators. And so, for the first time, these mammals needed to run quickly to outpace the larger carnivores. During the Paleocene, there was a paraphyletic group of mammals called the condylarths. They were basically the first group of Cenozoic mammals specializing in a diet of plants after the extinction of the dinosaurs. And they started down this path of becoming more nimble and quicker. They moved from exhibiting a plantigrade posture toward a digitigrade posture. In plantigrade mammals, the ankle joint comes in contact with the ground. This was the condition in all known Mesozoic mammals, and is found in many living mammals living today, including you. The condylars exhibited a new digitigrade posture, where the ankle does not contact the ground, and the metatarsals are elongated and are used to support the foot. Modern dogs have this new posture, as well as many other terrestrial mammals living today. Having an ankle off the ground produced a new lever in the anatomy of the leg during running and allows the animals to run at faster speeds. Now there was one further posture. If you really wanted to run fast, and fewer mammals have opted for this condition because it comes with a dark side or a downside. And so only two groups of mammals have opted for this condition. It's called the ungliograde posture, and it's where the toes, just the toes, support the entire body. And the ankle becomes a major joint in the distal hilum. This posture is only found in two groups of mammals, the parasodactyls and artiodactyls. Now, both of these orders of mammals did not appear until the early Eocene, 55.5 million years ago and nearly 10 million years after the extinction of the dinosaurs. Together, the Parasodactyla and Artiodactyla are called the ungulate mammals because they utilize this style of locomotion and have become some of the fastest mammals ever to live because of it. Now, there was one big drawback or dark side to the ungliograde posture. And it's one of the reasons that most mammals don't go for it. Once an animal commits to the ungliograde posture, it can no longer supinate its limbs. The ankle and the wrist joint become limited to just the back and forth motion in the sagittal plane, which means that ungulate mammals are not able to grip items or manipulate objects by using their hands or feet. This is a deal breaker for many mammals, like carnivores or animals that climb or dig because they can't twist their ankles or wrists. Because of these limitations, only two groups of mammals evolved this unique style of locomotion. And 
The weird thing is, is that they both appear in the fossil record at the same time, the earliest Eocene. The oldest Ariodactyl is a small deer-like animal called Diadexus, which appears in North America, Europe, and Asia at the base of the Eocene. It likely arose from a group of Paleocene mammals called Arctocyonids, which were small raccoon-like carnivores or omnivores. And in fact, many Ariodactyls retain large canine teeth, and some were even carnivorous themselves. Diadexus exhibits the major characteristic or synapomorphy of the group, a double poly astragalus. The earliest parasidactyl, like the tiny horse Shiva hippus, appears at the same time at the base of the Eocene, living in North America, Europe, and Asia. The earliest parasidactyls appear to have arisen from a group of dog-sized herbivore paleocene mammals called the Phenacodonta. Now you're probably wondering about why was the early Eocene a period of time for both of these mammals to become dedicated, running, ungulia-grade mammals? And it all has to do with global warming. At the boundary between the Paleocene and Eocene, the Earth underwent a massive global warming event. This triggered destruction of the forests around the world. This took away a lot of the cover that allowed slower mammals to hide from predators. Mammals that were swifter in the new desert-like environment did well and survived better because of their swifter, uh, being swifter runners. Even when global temperatures returned to normal, the parasidactyls and artiodactyls remained successful and would diversify during the rest of the Cenozoic. Now you may have heard the term even-toed ungulates and odd-toed ungulates. Artiodactyls are considered even-toed because living members tend to have either two or four toes, while parasidactyls are considered odd-toed ungulates because living groups tend to have either one or three toes. However, a better term that does not rely on toe numbers, as you can see tapers, which are parasidactyls, have four toes, is paraxic feet and mesiaxic feet. In paraxic feet, the axis of the foot is between digits three and four, while mesiaxic feet, the axis is along the third digit. Periaxic and mesiaxic feet can also be used to discriminate the condylars in the Paleocene into two major groups, a group containing the Arctocyonids and Mesonychids, exhibiting the periaxic condition, while the Phenacodontids and Hyopsodontids exhibit the mesiaxic condition. Thus, we can split out Paleocene groups as well using this feature instead of counting toes. But the feature that really distinguishes the parasidactyls from artiodactyls is in the astragalus bone in the ankle. In artiodactyls, the distal articulation of the astragalus bone is a groove rather than a ball and socket joint. This groove joint limits motion to a single plane and prevents the ankle from twisting. This astragalus is called a double pulley astragalus because it acts like a pulley system to deliver extremely quick movements to the distal foot. The artiodactyl astragalus bone is very distinct and unlike other bones. Its appearance in the fossil record can clearly tell you which group the animal belongs to. If you find one of these as a fossil, it can tell you immediately that the rocks from which you found the bone is younger than the Eocene epoch, and it belongs to an artiodactyl. The parasidactyl astragalus is somewhat similar in that the distal joint switches from a ball and socket joint to a groove joint, but the astragalus exhibits a more flattened shape and the groove is not nearly as deep as in artiodactyls, and it still retains sort of a neck. Another bone that's frequently found in the fossil record is the cannon bone. The cannon bone is simply the fusion 
of the metatarsal bones in more advanced perissodactyls, like modern horses, the cannon bone is simply a single metatarsal, while in more advanced artiodactyls, it is a fusion of two bones, like uh, in modern camels. Thus, if you find a cannon bone, you can tell which group the fossil belongs to as well. A double-headed metatarsal is unique to artiodactyls. All right, you should be able to distinguish the astragalus bone of parasodactyls and artiodactyls. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the Utah State University's geology program, check out the website geology.usu.edu or my own website at benjamin.berger.org. Links are found in the description below.